introduce or speak on this topic in a way that is um, hostile, but to just present the Word of God. And uh, I, I, I really do believe that God is going to minister to the body today through His Word. So let's pray, and then I'll introduce that topic, and then we'll get into our study. Father, thank you that you are a good and gracious creator. We begin with that thought, so important for us to remember that this world, our lives, nothing would exist apart from your gracious act of creating the world and putting it all into existence in order and in a perfect design. Your plan from the beginning to create a people for yourself, to fill the earth with image bearers. But we come to you knowing, Lord, that sin has come into the world and it has marred and messed up and made brokenness such a prevalent thing in our world. And so we come to you admitting our need, either either admitting our need or rejecting the fact that we do need you. So Lord, wherever we are this morning, I pray that your grace would be evident that the mercy that you've shown many people in this room would be evident, that the gospel would be preached and made clear, and Lord, every heart would be turned to you in worship and in adoration, because you are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. You're worthy of this time. You're worthy of us setting aside a day a week at least to come together as a whole body to worship you, to lift your name, to remember your death in communion, and to put ourselves in front of your word, to hear the word of God preached, and to be equipped for the work of the mission. So equip this body today. Strengthen us. Lead us, Lord. Speak to me. Speak through me. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we are talking about the rapture of the church and the second coming. And the truth is, We are almost five years old as a church, and we have never preached topically on the doctrine of the rapture. Now, I've come out of a, I mean, various people in this room have come from various places where the rapture is a a prominent doctrine, where five years without talking about it would have been almost blasphemy, but it's, um, to me, it's not at the top of the list, but again, it's a conversation that many of you are having, and I'm sure many of you have had it. What is the rapture? When's it going to happen? How many of you have had that conversation before? Come on, raise your hands. Don't be shy. Most of you. When's it going to happen? So I think it'll be good to talk about it. My goal in talking about the rapture and the second coming of Jesus is to answer some questions. And so let me just lay out the questions, and maybe these are already in your mind. Number one, what is the rapture of the church? Because there is a chance that you're here today and you don't even know what I'm talking about. So we want to Be sure to address that. When will the rapture take place? So if you've heard of the rapture, that's definitely something you've talked about, and we want to address as best as we can what does Scripture say about when the rapture will take place. Thirdly, is the rapture and the second coming the same event, or are they two distinct events? And that is certainly one of the center, central parts of the debate, if, if there were to be one, is around the timing of the rapture and whether they are a distinct event, each one, the second coming of Christ and the rapture. So, and then finally, how should these doctrines affect our lives on earth today? Because what's the point? What is the point of talking about any biblical doctrine if it doesn't have an effect on our lives, if it doesn't actually do something to encourage us to live godly lives and walk with Jesus Christ as disciples? So this is not a, a topic or a subject that we're going to look at in order to increase your debate skills, Okay. I want, we, we, need, we need to be grounded in the Word of God and grounded in Scripture. So that's the purpose of this. All right, so we'll begin with that first question. What is the rapture of the church? And there's only one text. You might be surprised. There's only one text that I'm aware of. And if there's others, you can come tell me afterwards. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But I believe there's one text that directly, absolutely directly speaks of what we have come to know as the rapture of the church. And it is a significant eschatological passage. Again, eschatology, it's just the study of the last things, the end times, if that word is new to you. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read verse 16 to 18. 
And again, this is the, the text that directly, now there's other inferences in Scripture that you may point me to, but where it's directly brought up, this is, this is the text. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, and it will also be on the screen if you would prefer. Always encourage you to bring your own Bibles, though. Bring your Bibles, flip through the pages, follow along. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So where is the rapture? Okay, what? That did not say rapture. And some of you are already tracking with me. You've studied this, you know, but please, let's just take a look at this. There's two English words that are in this translation, the English translation that we just read, and it's the word caught up. That's where we're getting the idea of the rapture. Those two words are translated from a Greek word. If you care about the Greek, you can go around using this word, harpazo. People be like, what the harpazo? Yeah, it means caught up. People think you're nuts, but that's the Greek word. Harpazo, it's right there in the text. It means to snatch away with force. And I love this second meaning, or to claim for oneself eagerly. Isn't that cool? That's what it means, to be snatched away suddenly with force or to claim for oneself eagerly. Now, that still doesn't say rapture, so what's going on here? That Greek word is, is an equivalent word to the Latin Vulgate's translation of that Greek text, and it's the word rapeo. Sounds a little bit more like rapture, so the English word for that is rapture. That's how we get the phrase rapture, okay? Okay. I, it really doesn't bother me if people don't use the word rapture. That's fine. It is not in the text. It's a variation of a few words. But again, that's definitely what's been popularized. So. But that also, that Latin word also means to be caught up or snatched away. So is the word rapture in the Bible? Somebody will say it's not even in the Bible. And you can just say, well, it is in this way in the Bible. And there it is. It's in our English Bibles. A couple other places to just show this same type of thing happening. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 39. If you guys can swing over there quickly, that's fine. But I'll just reference it. Acts chapter 8, verse 39 says, And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That's the word. Same word. Harpazo. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. To be physically carried away, Philip was raptured. He was caught up. He was caught away. His body was moved from one place to another. That's a little weird. It's a very unique uh, text in the New Testament, but it it happened. Philip was carried away mysteriously to another place. So what is the rapture? Here's the definition. It is the sudden snatching away of God's people, the church, from the earth at some point in our future and near the end of time. I think if you were to look at a holistic view of what is taught about the rapture or the caught, catching up or the snatching away of God's people, that would be a good definition. I'll say it again. I didn't, it's not on the screen, but if you want to write it down, it's the sudden, the sudden snatching away of God's people, and we get that from the Greek meaning, to be taken by force or to receive to oneself eagerly. It's the snatching away of the church from the earth at some point in our future. Sounds kind of vague, like, man, just tell me when. No, at some point in our future, And we'll just say somewhere near the end of time, okay? Is that that, that good enough definition for you? Next question. And this will, I think, it'll be further defined as we go along. The next question is, when will the rapture take place? Okay, so it's it's, it's important to note that Christians generally do not disagree on whether the rapture happens. Even in the variety of viewpoints that have been argued about the rapture, it's never, is it an event that takes place? It's always, what is the nature and the timing of the event? So Christians should believe in the rapture. I believe in the rapture of the church. You should believe in the catching up of God's people because it's in the text and it's going to happen. The text doesn't say exactly in that point um, what many people think it says. It doesn't give a specific timing. And so we're going to talk about that. Does this conversation even matter? That might be a question that you have. I've definitely heard that before. Is it even worth talking about? If we can't really know, 
then why? And if it's not the gospel, why? And I guess it, it ultimately depends on how you're looking at it. How, how are you looking at this conversation? Is someone saved, redeemed, forgiven by their understanding of these things? Absolutely not. We would never conclude that you must know this as a foundational principal doctrine for your salvation in Jesus Christ. It's, it's certainly not that important. I think we would all agree on that, hopefully. Salvation comes because a gracious Father, Heavenly Father, sent His only Son into the world to die for sinners. That's where salvation comes. That He might draw those sinners lovingly to His Son, the Son that was given on our behalf to die on our behalf so that we would trust him and be forgiven of our sins. That's where salvation, that is the top of utmost importance. Paul says that to the Corinthian church. These are of utmost importance that Jesus came according to the scriptures, that he died according to the scriptures, that he rose according to the scriptures. So we're clear on that, that it is, it is not of that much importance, but those gospel truths are of utmost importance. But we read in the scripture, when we read in the scripture, it becomes clear that Jesus did care about his church knowing how to think about the kingdom. And if our study in Daniel has said anything to us, it's that that matters. It matters how we think about the kingdom and God's plan for his people and how the kingdom plays out in history. And God does care about that. And even Christ, he taught in, in, in so many words that spoke of the importance of the kingdom. But not only that, but how to live in the kingdom, how to spread the gospel of the kingdom, and even how to wait with excitement and faith-filled anticipation for his return. We know the scripture teaches us to think about the return of Jesus. It tells us that that is an absolute important event that should not be brushed aside. So we should not divide over these issues, but every disciple of Jesus Christ should take seriously all that scripture teaches. So I would encourage you, don't categorize any biblical teaching as unimportant. It may be less important than the gospel that you would preach to someone on the street. I never go to somebody who isn't in Christ and open, my opening line is about the rapture ever. I've never, ever done that. And I would recommend don't do it. It has been done. It has been done. There are people who evangelize with the message of the rapture. That is not the gospel. And you're making something of utmost importance that isn't. Right? Now, the rapture is important, but not to the same level as the gospel. So we need to take it seriously, but do so with all humility. Why? Because there are different views. There are different views on this. So we need humility. We need the grace of God. So in regards to the question, when will the rapture take place, there are several views. We're going to get back into the text, I promise you. We're going to look at several texts, but I want to lay out some of these things a little bit beforehand. So there are several views. If you remember a few weeks back, Isaac was preaching on the variety of views on the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign. You had the the premillennial view, the amillennial, the postmillennial, and then this fourth category, the premillennial dispensational. Those are the four primary views in terms of the millennial kingdom. And you just got to have to deal with that. Okay? Cuz those are all those are four views that are held by your brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe. Okay? Not one is better, not one person is better than the other for believing a certain thing. We do all aim for truth, right? We want to know what the truth is. And so there's this, hopefully, a collective idea of, hey, we're all just trying, we want to find out what the truth is. We want to know what scripture says. And that's a good, a good aim to have. So there's a really good chance that if you've thought about the timing of the rapture, then you already know about these views that I'm about to mention. And it's the pre-tribulation, the mid-tribulation, and the post-tribulation views. How many of you have heard of those three views of the rapture? I would guess that that's actually maybe as far as most people think the views vary. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Without even considering the fact that there are entire views on eschatology as a whole that shape even how you begin to think about the timing of the rapture. Each of these views on the timing are distinctly a premillennial viewpoint. The pre-trib, the mid-trib, and the post-trib all believe that Jesus returns before the millennial kingdom. And then you have the fact that there are other views 
that see the millennium as an entirely different thing and therefore the return of Jesus at a different time. So you have the post-millennial and the amillennial. If you're just catching up with us on this and these are overwhelming words and you're really, really curious, come find myself or Eric or one of the other elders, Mark, who is up here, John, he's sitting back there. There's, there's people around that could talk to you about these things and try to catch you up on them. Premillennial dispensationalists hold to a view that there is an age in our future in which God refocuses his saving grace on ethnic Israel. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on this viewpoint is because it is the most popular view right now. It is the most. And so there's a reason for that. And it is popular. And it is most definitely, most likely the view that most Christians in the state of Maine are thinking along the lines of. And again, it is a serious view. And serious Christians hold this view. But it, because it's the most popular, I wanted to lay out what this one generally looks like, and it will sound probably very familiar to you. But they hold to the view that in our future, God refocuses his grace on ethnic Israel as a chosen people separate from the church of God. That's a distinct doctrinal difference between post-millennials, amillennials, and then the dispensational view that there is a distinct plan for Israel that will be continued later as eschatology plays itself out, specifically during a seven-year tribulation and then the future millennial thousand-year reign. This refocusing begins with a seven-year tribulation. During that time, there's a reign of a final Antichrist, which we covered when John preached through that, this idea of Antichrist. There may be another future final world ruler and dictator. There, just, there may be or there may not be. And the rebuilding of a third temple is certainly within that mindset, and then the reinstituting of a Jewish law and sacrifice. Now, according to the pre-tribulation rapture view, which is definitely the most popular view, the church would not be present during that seven-year tribulation. Who's heard of that view before? That's the, the seven-year tribulation, the church is, is gone. That's, that's as a result of the rapture. The church would not be present, but has been raptured prior to and escaping the seven years of tribulation. After this time, so just track with me here, after that time, um, sorry, <laughs> after that time, after the seven year tribulation, Christ physically returns. So after the rapture and after a seven year tribulation, Christ physically returns to this earth once again, sets up his millennial kingdom, not New Jerusalem, but a millennial kingdom, a time in which Satan is bound and then there's peace on earth. It sounds like a great time, really, doesn't it? A millennial kingdom where Satan is bound and there's peace, peace on earth relative to what we've experienced here. The church is said to rule and reign with him during this time. After the thousand years, Satan is loosed for a short period of time then judged along with the rest of the dead, and then finally, New Jerusalem. This is kind of a, just a general overview of what that view teaches. Now, much of this, if you're curious, go home today, read Revelation 19, 20, and 21, okay? This, these last three chapters of Revelation really do bring out a lot of this doctrine that's being talked about here. So these other two views that are quite different than the premillennial view the amillennial and the postmillennial believers aren't actually wondering if we're going to be raptured before a seven-year great tribulation. So you need to know that if, you're a, if you believe the pre-tribulation rapture and you're a premillennial dispensationalist, you need to understand that there are Christians in this world amongst you even today that aren't actually thinking about the rapture coming prior to a seven-year tribulation because they're thinking about the, the tribulation itself in those seven years in a completely different category. We're not so much concerned about whether the se about the seven-year tribulation or the, the rapture happening before a millennial reign. And these, both of these views see the reign of Christ as not a thousand-year period, but a span that covers the res from the resurrection of Christ until his final return. And just as a recap, that's what Isaac also taught a few weeks ago, was the both, both the amill and the post-millennial view see that as the millennial reign, not a literal thousand years, but a long span of time from the point of Christ's resurrection and ascension to the time that he finally returns. Now, where do we get that from? We've been studying in Daniel, and I've certainly sought to make the case that it's possible, it's possible that Christ is reigning right now. Is that possible? It's possible. 
I believe he is reigning right now. And that's where we get that. The prophecies of Daniel point us to a a reign of Christ where he crushes the enemies and he sets up a kingdom that's like a mountain that grows and covers the whole earth. And we believe, and I'm, you, where, which, which, which point am I coming from? You can probably already hear it coming out. I said we, but I don't mean to include you if you're not with me. But, <laughs> but that's the view that I would say is actually, we're, we're, that's happening right now. The church is growing. The gospel is spreading. Christ reigns, actually seated at the right hand of the Father and is ruling and reigning his church and this world right now. He's doing it right now. And so obviously that would change how we think about a future reign because we're not waiting for a reign of Christ. He's reigning right now. Much of the prophecies, or not all, but much of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and Matthew 24 are seen as being fulfilled in the first century before or at 70 AD. Now that's not all of the amillennial view, um, that's a particular view within postmillennialists that believe that most of the prophecies have already been fulfilled, but there's still some yet future. All right, but that is, that is why that is seen in a, in a different light. It's not hard then to see the thousand years not as a future reign, but as a figurative long span of time in which Christ is reigning. And that is, I'll be very honest, what I have come to believe. Why is this? And again, it's largely in part due to Daniel and all that we've taught up to and in chapter 7 in relation to when dominion is given to Christ and when rule was given to Christ and subsequently when was it given to his saints. And if you remember, as we've been teaching through Daniel, there certainly does seem to be this idea that Christ gives dominion to his people and he has given us his authority and he has sent us out into the world under the authority of Jesus, the reigning rule of Christ to make disciples of all nations and to see the whole world be discipled. I believe that that's actually what's happening. Now, the position I'm primarily presenting regarding the rapture and the return of Christ is post-millennial view. I, I don't necessarily see it as my job to persuade you to that, but I do want to be honest with you that that's the point of view that I'm teaching from and, and that I've, uh, from a study of Scripture, what I've been persuaded of, but I don't want to persuade you to see it according to my view, necessarily. I do want you to be persuaded by your own serious study of Scripture. And I would just say, let that set on your heart. If you've not seriously studied studied Scripture, but yet you have a firm view on eschatology or the return of Christ or the rapture, then you need to go back and do a serious study of Scripture. And if you come to the same conclusion, praise God. Again, there are serious, honest God-fearing, Jesus-loving people that come to different conclusions. Do you guys get, you hear why I'm trying to emphasize that, right? You, you get what I'm saying? Okay. I don't want anyone in this room, and we've said this before, that if we don't represent your view, it's not because we think less of anybody. It's because we all are just really seriously trying to study Scripture, and we, we really want to encourage you all to do the same thing. So, Let's look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. You'll, you'll recognize it. So beginning in verse 15, 22, all the way to verse 26, it's the great resurrection passage where Paul argues that because Christ is raised, we also will be raised. So let's look at this together. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 26. Paul says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then, first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So notice the phrases that are generally related to the end of time. Then at his coming, you would tune in there, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, as I kind of work through this chronology, I want you to just follow along in the text and see where this takes place. There is a a chronology that's given in this text for us. We're told that Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits. The first fruits of what? The first fruits of resurrection. There is more resurrection to happen later, but Christ is the first fruits. He mentions the resurrection of those who belong to Christ, and then he gives the timing. When? At his coming. 
the resurrection, the remaining fruit of which Christ is the first fruits, there's another resurrection coming, and then when is it? It's at his, at his coming. What happens when he comes? He tells us. He delivers the kingdom to his father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. That's a great moment in eschatology where it's all been wrapped up and all the work of Jesus receiving unto himself, his people, his bride. He hands the kingdom to the father and it's this final consummation. It's been done. That's a beautiful thing. Then verse 25, he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. He must reign. You guys notice that word? And of course, I'm making an argument here, again, that Christ is reigning now. And Paul says that he must reign until a certain time period. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now think about this for a moment. When is death itself going to be destroyed? When in our future is the death that ravages our world And all the chaos that we see, when is all that going to be done? It happens when the dead in Christ are raised incorruptible at the resurrection of the saints. And then death will be finally destroyed completely. What has Christ done at the cross then? I thought Christ destroyed death. He killed the power of sin and death so that all who believe in him do not have to live under the reign of sin and Satan anymore. That death has been defeated. So that when you and I die today, if we are in Christ, I'm not saying we're all going to die today, but when you and I die today, like in the general vicinity of this era, (laughs) if you're in Christ, you'll be with him. Death doesn't hold you like it didn't hold Christ. That's that's glorious news. You all probably need to be reminded of that. And, And I do too. Now check this out. Paul was not lying to the Thessalonians. That word harpazo, it was there. The rapture, the snatching away of the church to meet the Lord in the air is real. That's going to happen. Again, the question is when? Something you need to know keeping all of these texts so far that we've read about the the chronology that was mentioned, the death that will come to an end at the time of the coming of Christ. You need to know this, that a rapture that is pre-tribulational in timing by default becomes what is called a secret rapture. How many of you have heard of the phrase secret rapture? Okay, far less of you. That is a pre-tribulational view. I didn't always know this, but a secret rapture is what is generally been, and and you'll recognize it. You'll you'll all be able to picture it easily because this is the scenario that we've seen played out and popularized in movies. This is exactly what we see when life is going on and all of a sudden, a sudden snatching away and a mysterious disappearance of all believers to be with the Lord while unbelievers at the time are, are left here in order to endure seven years of tribulation before, before Christ returns again. But this time, When he comes, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, he will come in judgment. So, have you heard that scenario before? It has to be a secret rapture because it's a sudden snatching away. And what I mean by secret is believers are just gone. It's not played out or seen or taught in synonymous with the second coming. With a secret rapture, you actually need to be able to account for two returns of Jesus. And this is one reason over the years that I've come to believe that the pre-tribulation rapture is not something that I would hold to because it does mean you have to believe in two returns of Jesus. With a space of time between those two returns. Now, if that's true, if that's actually what happens, I want that to happen. If that's what scripture teaches, I want that. I spent years like just reveling in the fact that I would be part of the rapture. And, and who wouldn't love that idea of leaving this earth before the worst cataclysmic events ever come? I, I, would. I, I would. I would enjoy that, <laughs> would you? Right? We would, we would like that, to miss any sort of hardship. 
But you have to have one return that is partial and then another that is a full return if you, and so I just want you to think about that. If that's a view that you hold to, just return to scripture and then ask yourself, is scripture, does scripture lay this out? And so let me, I want you to also ponder this. Um, later on, we're going to sing this song and I want you to think about this. When you say or sing the phrase, even so, come Lord Jesus. If you pray that prayer, come, Lord Jesus. How many of you have prayed that prayer before? Many of us have prayed, God, Lord Jesus, come. Come what? What's the next word? Come quickly. Come quickly. Lord, come. But when you say that, even so, Lord Jesus, come, what are you thinking about? In your mind, when you pray, Lord, come, are you thinking about the rapture or are you thinking about a return of Christ to judge the world? Just ponder that for a moment. I would submit that if you're praying, come Lord Jesus, and you're referring to a secret rapture in which believers leave this earth suddenly, then you're, I think, praying that out of context. Regarding a secret rapture, the only question we need to ask, and the only question that I'm really concerned with is, is it in Scripture? So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13 to 18. Just really pay attention, look at the text. Let's ask the text to speak. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Paul says to the Thessalonians, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Again, some of these words, I hopefully start to stir up to you in you now some of these definitions. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I'll just insert this little bit of a curiosity. This came up yesterday at our city group. The verses that explicitly tell us to encourage each other with these words tend to be some of the most discouraging topics in Christianity, (laughs) where there's fights and contentions, not an encouragement, but we need to be encouraged by these scriptures. So what's going on here? Paul is speaking to a church that had expressed worry about those who had died. This is the context. And how would Jesus deal with them when he comes? What happens to those who have already died and what is going to happen? How does Jesus deal with that? Paul assures them and is assuring us that those who have already died will not miss out on anything. So those who have already died and are dead right now, you're, if you have loved ones who are in Christ and they're buried or their ashes are spread somewhere, you have not to worry that they have missed out on something but in fact would precede those who are alive. And this is rooted in verse 15, that because Christ died and rose again, there is hope for those who have died. Because God will, quote, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And he's referring to those who have died. Then in verse 16, we have a descending of the Lord. Do you see that in the scripture? You have the descending of the Lord and three things you see. A cry of command from God, the voice of an archangel, pretty serious, and a trumpet blast of God all happening at the same event. To me, based on the text, this seems like one of the most disruptive and loudest events that will ever take place. I don't know about you, as you read the text, just plainly, what does it seem like to you? I'm not sure how secret this is supposed to be based on the text, but this is one view that certainly shows that the rapture is a separate view of the second coming of Jesus and the first one is secret where the believers leave and the second one is loud for the whole world to see. But when we read the text, and I'm just showing you the text, it doesn't seem to be that way. Then we see at the end of verse 16, the dead in Christ rising after which those who are alive will all be gathered. Again, so that gets us to think about the rapture. 
will all be gathered, a gathering up, and taken to heaven to be with the Lord? It doesn't actually say that, does it? But we insert that with our minds. We do. We insert that with our minds that when Paul says that we will be gathered to meet him in the air and so we will ever be with him, we insert that that means he's taking us to heaven for seven years and then we'll come back. But again, the text doesn't actually say that. It says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so what does this mean? What does it mean that we will meet the Lord in the air? Now, pay attention to this. Not that you weren't paying attention, but again, this is, this is maybe new stuff. There's an interesting word that Paul uses in verse 17. So glance back down at the text and see that word to meet, to meet the Lord in the air. It's actually a very significant word. How are we to meet him? What does that meeting look like? It's the Greek word apentesis. And it is, in fact, only used three times total in the entirety of the New Testament. Whenever I see a word that's used that minimally, it's, there's, it's pretty cool, honestly, because that means that there's a unique meaning for it, a unique purpose for it. I think you're going to like this. Matthew 25, verse 6 is one place where we see it. It's the, the parable of the ten virgins. It says, but at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom. And the call was to come out to meet him. Same Greek word. And then the second place is Acts 28, 15. It says, And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Apelius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. That's, and then the third time is here in Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, what, what does that have to do with anything? So here's, this is pretty cool. In the first two cases, those who are doing the meeting, the, ten, the, the brides, as well as those brothers who came out to meet Paul, they're coming out from their current places not to go where the other party came from, but specifically to meet the person and then continue their journey the rest of the way in. Now, I used to be somebody who said, that sounds foolish. Why would we go up to meet Jesus in the air and then come right back? Well, the same Greek word, the only other two times it's used in the New Testament is to describe that very thing, to go and meet the person and then come the rest of the way back in on their journey. The virgins went out to meet the bridegroom and then came into the wedding feast. Read the story and you'll, you'll see that. Paul was on his way into Rome when brothers heard about his coming. They journeyed all the way out into the countryside to meet him. And then the next verse says, and when we came into Rome, they met together and came back into Rome. I believe, I think that Paul chose his words carefully here, that he used a word that meant to meet and to continue a journey on the way back in. Those who were alive, when the dead in Christ are raised and those who are alive are caught up, it's not in order to be taken to heaven with the Lord. It doesn't say that. But to meet the Lord and then descend to earth with him, having received our resurrected bodies, coming to earth with him in judgment. With him in judgment and in victory, not as a separate event, but as one glorious event at the end of the age. One event in which we are caught up with the Lord and the Lord returns to this earth to judge and begin to wrap up all of human history. Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16, turn there. How's everybody doing? You guys good? Revelation 19, 11 to 16 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Who are they? It is the saints of God that are given and issued white robes when we see the Lord. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So if the rapture is not secret but public, and if it's not before a seven-year tribu tribulation, again, I'm just presenting this to you, 
and there's no gap between two separate comings of Jesus Christ, then what are we to think and what are we to expect? Because I know that for many, this will rock your, your senses to think that, what, that there could possibly be another view other than the pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm not just trying to scare you. I'm not just trying to scare you. Regardless of Christian pop culture or what the Left Behind series has taught or what the Schofield commentary says, now the reason I mention that is because there was a shift in our history. And if you look at history, what you'll see is that there were some major movers and shakers within Christianity that began to present a viewpoint that became very popularized and then books were written about these views and it spread like wildfire and it's still spreading. But I would just say, nothing should be considered true because of popular culture. If it is, that's, that's great. That's, if it's true, fine. But not because of those things. So ignore what you've heard from, from, from pop culture or Left Behind series or the, any commentary or what tradition says. Scripture must dictate our doctrine and our view of Christianity through history. Scripture must dic- dictate it. What has been said in Scripture must steer our thinking. And I just want to encourage you that based on what we've seen today in these texts, I don't believe that we're all waiting right now for a secret rapture to escape something that's coming. I don't believe that's the case. There is something to escape, and it's the wrath of God. It's the anger of God against sinners. But the way to escape is faith alone in Jesus Christ. The way to escape wrath, the way to escape God's judgment, which is definitely and seriously coming upon those who reject him and think he's foolish and has no, have nothing to do with him, worships some other God or worships some form of self, judgment is going to come upon this earth because of sin. But the way to escape that, the Bible does not teach that the way to escape that is through a secret rapture. The Bible teaches us over and over and over again that we escape that through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we escape judgment. Through trusting him, we take part in what the Bible calls the first resurrection. The first resurrection, all those scriptures that clearly tell us we were dead and he made us alive together with Christ. That's a resurrection in case you didn't realize that. And so all who believe in Christ have experienced the first resurrection and the scripture tells us for all who partake in the first resurrection will not experience the second death. You want to know what second death is? It is the final separation of God and sinner from which there is no turning back and no escape. And so we must preach the gospel now and take part in that first resurrection because over such the second death has no power. What we wait for now is the glorious return of Jesus. We we wait for his appearing. We wait for what the scripture says is our blessed hope. And that is a time when he will judge the world, he will transform our earthly bodies and destroy Satan himself. He will be destroyed, praise God, and make a new heavens and new earth where we will live with him forever. So be sure of this, brothers and sisters, and non-believers and skeptics, Jesus did come 2,000 years ago and he inaugurated his kingdom when he died and he rose again. He ushered in his rule and his reign and he is reigning right now. There is grace for people today. There is grace for you right now. If you're in this room and you're hearing my voice, you need the grace of Jesus. You need a gracious God who might look at you and not judge you for your sin, but instead grant to you the gift of his son, Jesus, and that he would give you his righteousness in place of your filthy rags. We need grace today, and that's what's evident and what is available today. How long are we to wait? How long are we to wait for the Lord's return until the Lord is ready? But if the purpose of the kingdom is to be like the mustard seed and the mountain that grew and the measure of leaven that was thrown into the dough and over time and somewhat inconspicuously leavened the whole lump, if that's what the kingdom of his like is like according to Jesus, then there is so much work to be done, is there not? There's work to be done 
in discipling the nations for our king and inviting more to bow to him as king today. We're not waiting for another inauguration. I don't believe we're waiting for a future reign. Jesus reigns now, and the proclamation of the gospel is to call people to bow to King Jesus and to surrender to the one who is king because there will come a day where it is too late. There absolutely will, and the scripture is very clear about that. But there's much work to be done. Let me just close with this final scripture that I hope is an encouragement to you. 2 Peter 3, 9 to 13. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Keeping all of this in mind, think about all that we've already talked about so far. I'm going to read this slowly. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What does Paul teach? What does Peter teach? What does Jesus seem to teach us that we are waiting for? We're waiting for his return. We're waiting for his return. And if this is a A difficult concept for you to begin to think through that there may not be a a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, there may be. I am not going to be so dogmatic to say that, that I'm right and you're wrong. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I would submit to you to look to Scripture, and I believe that there's some overwhelming texts that tell us that what we're waiting for is one event, and it is the final return of Jesus. And at that time, we will be caught up together with the Lord, and we will return with him in judgment. And what comes shortly after that? The dissolving of all that exists on this earth and a new heavens and a new earth, and we will all be part of that if we are in Christ. We are to wait for a new heaven and a new earth. Church, this is an exciting thing. If I I brought you low, now's the time to be brought back up, all right? This is what we rejoice in. We all rejoice together that Jesus is returning. He will come, and he will set his foot on earth again. He will judge, but praise God that Christ on our behalf was judged for us So we do not take part in that second death. We will not be separated from God for eternity. We will be with him forever and ever and ever. And there will be a new Jerusalem. There will be a new heaven and a new earth created created for us in which righteousness dwells and we all should long for that day. What manner of persons ought we to be? Peter tells us. Living lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day. What is the sign that we are to see from the fact that Jesus has not returned yet? Patience. Not slowness. He's patient. How patient is God? More than you and more than me. Far more. He's so patient. We could be here for another thousand years, church. We could be here another, for another 20. We don't know. When he decides to return, he'll return and every eye will see it. And it will be a glorious event. And we will forever be with the Lord. And I pray you're comforted by these words. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us this day to just think about your word and think about the gathering up, the being caught up to be with you in the air, to be with you forever. We believe that that is a true and, and it is a good and godly event to think about, to be snatched away. I pray you'd give us, all of us, a serious mind and a serious heart towards the study of scripture to not hold on to things that have just been handed down to us traditionally, but that we would form all of our thoughts and doctrine based on scripture. And Lord, it does seem to to be saying that what we are to wait for is the coming of the Lord, the return of Christ, the glorious appearing, our blessed hope that every eye will see. 
I pray that we would not have false securities in anything, but that our whole hope, everything that we hang our lives on will be in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to secure us in an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father. Thank you, God, for, for reconciling us to you through the blood of Jesus and for giving us forgiveness of sins and making us right before you. Uh, Lord, I, we pray for those who are hurting and broken and still in their sins. Would you, God, continue to be patient? And we entrust all of this to you. We pray that many hearts would turn, that in our lifetime we would see awakening, we'd see a turning of the tides of the Christian church, not looking for a way of escape, but proclaiming the way of escape, which is faith in Jesus, and together waiting for the return, whenever that might be. Make us busy about the work of the kingdom to spread the gospel. Give us your patience as we wait. But Lord, we thank you that you are. You are coming. We trust you with all of this. Fill our hearts with encouragement, with peace. Oh, but Lord, if we are not in Christ, Make our hearts so heavy. If there are any here that are not in Christ, oh Lord, let their hearts be so burdened by the weight of their own sin that they carry. And Lord, show them the way of escape is only in Jesus Christ. Be glorified, God. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the work of your spirit in our, in our midst. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.